Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay Howell and I am super excited to be here today. Um, first off, here's my Instagram. If you guys wanna share any takeaways you have on social, um, tag me, that'd be wonderful. That way everyone else could also partake in all the good stuff. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for coming to hang out with me. I know your time is valuable. And my hope today is that you guys will all learn something new. If you don't, I want you to call me. <laughs> so this is gonna be really interactive. I want you to let me know if you have questions. When you have a question, we won't um, wait till the end. So just speak up, raise your hand. Um, I've got some fun little koozies here to give away for those people who are brave enough to speak up. And if you look inside, there are little stickers inside with little free giveaways, uh, like $50 off coupons, free resume reviews, um, they have an N number associated with them, so um, if you are one of the lucky ones who win, um, all you'll have to do is just let me know and give me that N number. So, not all of them have a prize, though, so. <laughs> um, okay, so I need you guys to be interactive so that nobody calls me, okay? But first, we're going to do an icebreaker. So, who wants to fly for the airlines? Awesome. Who wants to fly corporate? Awesome. <laughs> um, who wants to be a firefighter? Who wants to uh, be a hurricane hunter? Maybe, yeah? <laughs> Agriculture, customs, border patrol? Okay. Um, so, I ask that because I firmly believe that the sky is the limit. I've had a lot of really amazing jobs in aviation. I haven't had a, a one track. I never was that person who said I want to fly for the airlines when I grow up. I just want to be in the sky. So I've had 20 years in aviation. I have a bachelor's of science degree, airway management science from Kansas State University. Um, I have flown seaplanes in the Caribbean and the rich and famous in corporate jets. Um, people always ask, well, have you flown anyone famous? And a lot of the times people don't know, you know, John Cusack or Michelle Pfeiffer, but they know the girl from The Big Bang Theory. Um, I've flown Citation 10, Lear 45, Hawker 800, Phenom, King Air, and the Twin Otter. So I also managed a flight school, Part 61 in Monterey, California, and I was an interview consultant for Cage Marshall Consulting. And that job, we were prepping pilots to um, have basically their, their airline interview. And um, that's, that's where I really noticed that some of the pilots I worked with, they needed a little extra something. Uh, sometimes they, they came to us and they didn't necessarily have uh, the confidence or they weren't sure how to present themselves. Their eye contact or, or handshake uh, was lacking. There was also the other pilot who would come to us and, you know, it's like you have this 20 year dream of working for the airlines and you wait to the last minute to do your interview prep. Their log books were in disarray. Their resume wasn't great. And so they waited to the last minute. And so I created this program that would put everything that you would need to know outside of the cockpit to let you guys know all those things you need up until that point of getting your dream job. I'm not texting, I have the slide notes on my phone. So. <laughs> So I created the five-step plan to the flight deck, and it looks at the pilot as a whole. Um, it works on the internal, the external, uh, how you apply yourself, your paperwork, documentation, and then the mentorship. How do you pay it forward afterwards? Um, so you're not going to, I'm not making astronauts here, but hopefully you'll feel on top of the world when you're done with, with my course. So, so the five-step plan to the flight deck. The first step is the mindset. Now, when I started flight school, I had this voice inside of my head that said, I'm not smart enough, I'm not capable, I'm not good at math and science, how am I ever going to get there? Um, thankfully, I had really good parents that said, you know what, you're just building um, a foundation, just go in with building blocks. And so I think a lot of times pilots have this negative voice that say, just that, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough. And so we work on that voice and we look at those negative voices. We have 50,000 thoughts a day that are on autopilot. And so we... The first step is looking at what are those voices and you change them from negative to positive and you start having those I am smart I am successful I am capable I am a captain 
we also do some belly breathing, um, body work, pressure points. Second step is the presentation, and that part is the, the mock interview, because that is a really good way to see how people do present themselves. So we do a mock interview, and then we, we work on the five events of mastery, and what that means is, um, you know, it's one of those things to help build your confidence. You look at things you've done in your past where you've been really good, whether it was climb a mountain or run a triathlon or your, your first solo, and you bring those thoughts forward and, and you go on and off those confidence. Um, events. So the third step is the application. How do you set goals and how do you study and pass tests? So with every rating license you have, you guys all know that you have three tests to take. Um, a lot of times it's really hard to just walk in and, and know how to study for those, how to pass those tests, how to study for the oral. So we look at that. We look at how we learn. Um, the, the brain is an amazing thing. And once you understand how you study with the diffuse and the focused mind, it really helps with learning how to study. But documentation is is pretty much everything else. Your your logbooks, your resumes, letter of reference, um, driving records, GPA, transcripts, where you've lived, where you've worked, all of that. Um, the fifth step is mentorship. Once, um, how do you pay it forward? So, um, this is a crazy picture. Would you do this, Ula? Yeah. <laughs> we were so I thought this was a cliff and he was jumping off a cliff, but I think it's a hot air balloon. Uh it's a hot air balloon. Uh, like a zip line. Kind yeah. Of so there's zip line in between the two? Mm -hmm. I think so. So Jordan, what's the craziest thing you've done in aviation? Yeah, or flying in the sky. Anyone, has anyone done something to this level? I think uh, that's a sign. Everyone who has I probably wouldn't do this, but um, so it's time to choose your own adventure. So that's why I had that fun slide up. So I know your guys' time is valuable and I don't wanna bore you with, with all the detail. I want you guys to be able to choose what you wanna to learn today. If there's time, we could do more than one. But this is what I thought would be really, um, you know, the meat and the potatoes and I wanna give you guys what it is you want. So A, what you need to know about interviewing. B, how to get crystal clear with your flying goals. And C, what documentation matters most to getting a flying job. For 500, Alex. So I thought, let's clap. Why don't you guys let me know what you want to hear more of? A. Nobody? Me. I want to know what that is. Okay. Uh, B. Flying goals. Yeah. Okay. And C, what documentation matters most to getting a flying job? Okay. So let's start with that one, and then we have, if we have time, we could double back. Okay, so um, what matters most? Documentation and disclosure. So we start with logbooks, resume, applications. Oh my, because those are the biggest. Um, we'll get into logbooks and resumes and application next. Um, does GPA really matter? What do you guys think? I think the matter that you have the degree is what matters, but I don't think your GPA needs to be put on. Put on where? On your, on your resume. Okay. Um, Unless it's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, your GPA is going to matter to some companies, and they do want to see it on your resume. Um, and it's usually to two places, not just 3.1, but 3.15. It needs to match what's on your transcript. So the biggest thing with being a professional pilot is having that attention to detail. We assume that you're here because you're a good stick, right? You're, you're good at flying. 
but what's your attention to detail? What does your paperwork look like? How do you present yourself on paper? Um, because let's face it, most of the time they're gonna see you on paper before they actually see you in person. If your paperwork is out of order, disorganized, it's going in the, in the trash, right? So GPA matters. What about driving records? Absolutely. What about that speeding ticket from 10 years ago? Absolutely. I think it's very important. That's not something. Are we talking about what's going on with me? No, this is all of the documentation that you will carry with you to your dream job, right? Yeah, so it is going to matter. And a, uh, a, tri a tip here is that um, you have to read the application very carefully because some airlines will say in the past 10 years, have you ever had a? Some airlines will say, have you ever had a? Um, infraction or felony, right? So a lot of times people say, oh, that was 20 years ago, it doesn't count. But you have to be careful what the application says because sometimes it will say, have you ever? And it matters full disclosure, right? Even if it has been expunged, you still wanna put it on there because um, you don't wanna look like a liar. You, you could get a job for having a lot of speeding tickets, but you won't get a job if you look like a liar. Does that make sense? Jordan. You got a koozie. <laughs> they don't fly very well. <laughs> um, and so another point with that too is that they're looking for negative patterns, right? So it's okay if you have had maybe one or two things in your past, or um, maybe you have a speeding ticket from last year, but, but what most companies are looking for are those negative patterns. Do you have five speeding tickets? Do you have a low GPA? Do you have um, a new residence every other year, right? Of, of those that they're gonna start questioning, like what's going on here with this person, right? So um, residences. So we're pilots, we move a lot, right? I was just gonna say, is that a big deal if you move all the time? No, okay. no, we're pilots, we move a lot. It's the okay. business, right? Okay. But the point is, is that now is a great time to start keeping track, right? Of the dates you live in a place, your address, and maybe your landlord or a reference. Okay, so now get out that Excel spreadsheet and start documenting that. Because there's gonna come a time where you're applying for a job and they say, where have you lived in the past 10 years? And you're like, a lot of places. And I don't even know where to start with that. So start keeping track of those residences. Same thing with, with employment. Start tracking down where you've worked, your days of employment, and your supervisor. It's a real pain to have to go back and dig up all that stuff. Yeah. Can I take a step back to the driving yeah. records? Um, let's say many, many, many years ago, when some people are young and stupid, they had quite a few driving speeding tickets. Is no, that some? It doesn't matter. <laughs> no, in this country. In this country. Um, is that something that they should try to go back and get the dates up if it's been more than 10 years? Or is that something? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. The more information you could have uh, presented at your interview, the better. So if you could go back to your the National Driving um, Registry and find all those dates, the better off you're going to be because you're just going to say, here, here is everything you need to know about me. And they might say, why so many speeding tickets? And you would say, I was driving a fast car. I was 17. I had to learn the hard way. I haven't had any speeding ticket for the past 10 years. And they'll say, okay. Right? But if you say, yeah, I had a lot and I don't really know anything else about them, they're gonna be like, mm, what's what else is going on here? You see how that's yeah. So any other questions about I guess a uh, question about like so you have a lot of recent speeding tickets or whatnot. Do you have any I'm not saying that I do. <laughs> Steven. <laughs> but if you do, like what are good ways of I guess if they're recent and you're going into an interview, do you have any remedies that you would suggest someone like, would it be beneficial to go attend a driving school or? Sure, any like anything you could say, um, you know, I yes, I, I know I have these speeding records um, and since then I've, I go the speed limit, I don't have anything on my record in the past year. You know, they want to see a couple years of a clean record, right? We're talking about those negative patterns. But anything you could do to help the situation is going to be in your favor. 
or you know hypothetically someone's favor <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so letters of reference. Um, have any of you had to pull up a letter of reference or ask for a letter of reference from someone? Okay, uh, Liz, how did you do it? How did you go about? Yep, how did you get a letter of reference? So I usually used to travel to my job, and towards the end of the time that I was there, um, I would go to the person who was making the decision to hire me and ask them, I really enjoyed my time here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Can I bother you for a letter of reference so that the next people might know and get a better feel for the type of employee that they're looking at when they see me? Excellent. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, and you're, you're totally right that you may not need that at the time, but you know enough that you grab it while you're there, right? Yeah. I have a question about that because I had a scenario come up where um, I had someone want to give me a, rec a letter of recommendation because they thought I did a great job. And I was like, yeah, I'll let you know when I need one. So you're saying it's better to get it. Like it doesn't, if it's got like an old date on it, it's, is it a big deal? You know what I would do if they're offering, you get that letter. <laughs> okay. And when you need it, always go back and say, I am applying for this job. Would you mind? updating it and here is the the title or, or the company that i'm applying for could you put that in there now okay. because you want them to have a good fresh memory of you right so just get that letter um and it could even be used for scholarships right and you can say hey i'm applying for the scholarship would you mind dating it or addressing it to the scholarship committee um because whether it's, it's an employee or a scholarship committee they want to know that those letters of reference are accurate if it just says you know, to whom it may concern, and it's five years old, like, you didn't try very hard, you know? So yeah, definitely get that letter when someone offers it and always, you know, go back and just ask them to update it. Um, so for me, letters of reference are a big pet peeve of mine. Um, I could talk about this for a long time, but if we have more questions, you could always come back and I'll tell you more. So I really think that when you're asking for a letter of reference, it's good to call somebody and say, Hi, would you please get me a letter of reference? Um, I could email you an updated resume and I could even write a couple paragraphs of, of what it's for or I did really well in, the, in this job and it'd be great if you could highlight that for me, All right? And then you, you're giving them something to work with and you're being very specific with what you want them to say, which is excellent. Um, afterwards, send them a quick thank you. Let them know you got the scholarship or you got the job. Or that you didn't. You can say, you know what, I am i didn't uh, get the scholarship or, or job, but I'd like to try again and I'll let you know. Um, so always let them know because they're, they're going to be wondering what happened to, to your job. Did you get it? Did you not? And you want to, you know, if you have a good supervisor, you want to be able to call on them again, right? Um, letters of reference. Okay, so volunteering. Does anyone here volunteer for any organization? Yeah, for JDRF. What is that? Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. Perfect. Okay. And how often do you volunteer with them? Um, I've been volunteering with them regularly for like five, six years now. And is it every weekend, once a year? Like once a month, usually. Perfect. Yeah. What's your title there? It's just volunteer. Just okay. I don't do any, like, I don't step up for any, like, chairs or anything like that. It's not. So do you do marketing for them or any fundraising or? Well, fundraising is okay. most of it, but a lot of it can just be, you know, marketing and emailing parents and, and things like that. Sure. So when you put that on your resume, you want to be very specific too. What about you, Beth? I've done a lot of volunteering in the past right now, um, but we're trying to get involved with the Ronald McDonald House. And we're going to start volunteering with them. Excellent. Here's some swag for you guys. What about you, Steven? Um, I've done some like volunteering for like sports teams in the past, uh, back when I was in high school, and then also planning on doing a lot of major flight stuff with the uh, airplane that we have uh, in the works right now. So excellent. Anyone else? I used to do. I worked with well with a. I used to live in England. My Spouse was military, and there was a lot of large Russian community on that base, and they did a lot of translating through the court system, whatever they did. So 
struggled for about six years, but I don't know if that's considered volunteering or. Sure. Yeah. So, um, when you are ready for the airlines or that that big job of yours, most companies want to see volunteering on a resume, right? It shows that you're well-rounded, you're giving back, you're a kind, caring human being. And so my advice is um, now is a really good time to start being involved with, with a volunteering um, organization. But do something it is that excites you. Don't just think you have to volunteer for Toys for Tots because it looks good. If you're excited about who you're volunteering for, you're really gonna enjoy yourself, and that's what, what matters. Um, it does not have to be aviation, but definitely on a resume, they wanna see um, your position. Um, not just volunteer, but what did you do there? Um, and how long have you been doing it? It's okay to have like your own, I clean up the um, church uh, playground or, escort for the church or park cleanup, right? It's okay to have those on there, but you need to be specific too. So um, now's a good time to start volunteering and definitely do something that you that you enjoy. Um, Makes sense? So the point of this slide is um, now's a great time to start keeping track of all your documentation and full disclosure, right? So it's okay to have had a failed check ride or a speeding ticket. Um, and someday it's gonna matter how you talk about that, but it's, it's better to have full disclosure than to try to like bury it in your past, okay? Okay, logbooks. Obviously logbooks are really important to pilots. Um, who has an electronic logbook? Yeah. So it used to be that airlines did not want to see your electronic logbook. They wanted your paper logbooks. Now they understand that they're also very great documents. You might just have to bring both into an interview and that's totally acceptable. There's a lot of places where you could just print it out and get it on a three ring binder and it's perfect. Um, electronics also really good to kind of, you know, start separating all those flight times, your single engine and a piper and your night time and your night IFR time, right? So log, electronic logbooks are really good for that. Um, errors. So I was doing interview prep for a guy once and he had so many errors on one page, he glued them together. So he had about three pages that were glued together. I know not a good idea, right? Because then I'm thinking, what's he hiding? in here right i wanted to pry them open and see what was really going on so once again attention to detail you want to have clean logbooks if you make mistakes it's okay to have you know a page or a line where you audit your times to make sure that they're accurate and they line up most people understand that your first logbook might be a little messy you know private pilots are just learning how to like do addition and stuff, which is fine. <laughs> but the more professional you get, you want your logbooks to look really nice. Okay, yeah. Um, going back to the electronic logbooks, do you have any that you recommend that seem to work very really well with people you talk to? I could, I'll definitely get you that information later. Yeah. It seems that there's a lot of companies out there that do a really fine job printing off, and um, they understand what it's for. So they, you know, they'll put Captain Steven on you know, they'll make it nice, so. Um, okay, and everyone knows that your time should equal your total time, right? So your single engine, your multi-time should equal your total time. Also, helicopter, glider, seaplane, they should all equal your total time, right? That's a good way to audit your logbook. Um, using it as a diary is also really helpful um, because if you have an event that happens, say you had an, an engine uh, failure and you know, you could document it in your logbook. Well, that's gonna be a really good interview question someday. But maybe you forgot about it. So you're getting ready for your interview and you flip back through your logbook and you're like, oh yeah, that happened with so-and-so on that date. I remember we handled that situation really well and it's it's now a good interview question. So it's really good to document those situations. Obviously, you don't ever wanna put anything bad in your logbook like so-and-so is a major blank to fly with, right? <laughs> Still keep it professional because someone is going to look at that someday when you present your logbooks at an interview. Um, but for you, it, it's, it could be a really good tool to use. So, who logs SIM time in their logbook? 
who logs sim time as total time in their logbook? Okay, good. So this usually seems to be a really good uh, debate question between pilots because somewhere along the way, I think someone said level D sim counts as, as total time. Um, so for this slide and for you guys, I contacted my buddy at the FAA. He works at the Atlanta FISDO. And I said, how can you put this in the most simplest terms for me? He says, well, let's go back to flight time. Flight time is pilot time that commences when an aircraft moves under its own power for the purpose of flight and ends when the aircraft comes to rest after landing. Therefore, simulator time is not considered flight time. Therefore, it is not considered total time. You can pad your logbook very, very well flying a simulator all day long. Don't do that. <laughs> um, log it as, as simulator time. And it's just that FTD or simulator time, okay? And even if it's a level D or C. Yes? I think a lot of people get confused because of in the commercial stage using these 50 hours towards the total time. Sure. Um, and I think that's where the confusion really comes in. It's just like the cross country with ATP and commercial. Right. Um, it's just different definitions. Yep, for sure. And even so, when you go get a type rating, like that is going to be part of your flight training is training in that aircraft simulator. And there are full motion simulators that are very helpful for flight training or flight reviews, um, but it's still not total time. Basic, basic question, what is a level C and D simulator? What does that mean? I think those are the um, full motion. Okay. Or approved by the FAA, yeah. however they approve them. Yeah. You guys have the red birds here? Yeah. What level is that? They are not flight simulators. They're advanced aviation training. Yeah. FTD, FTD. log it as FTD. Yeah. What used to be called FTD. Yeah. Okay. So um, did you guys know that there are more airplanes in the sea than ships in the air? <laughs> Does anyone know um, where this aircraft is? Yep. Here you go. This is for you. Okay. <laughs> like I said, they don't fly well. Um, okay, so resumes. This is a pretty good looking pilot resume. Charlie Romeo. Um, we'll go here. So black ink, uh, no blue ink, no shadow boxes. Keep it very simple, professional and equal margins on all sides. You don't want to have, you know, little itty bitty margins on the side and big ones at the bottom. So equal margins on all sides. Your font, 11 is good, and Garamond is a very nice, clean font to use. You get a lot in with Garamond. Um, including an objective is optional, but it shows attention to detail. You just want to make sure that if you are going to a job fair or an interview for FedEx, you do not hand them a resume that says Delta. Okay? <laughs> I've seen it. <laughs> um, the order of information from top to bottom. Certificates and ratings, because those are more, most important for a pilot. Flight time, also important. And then your experience, the jobs you've had. If you have military experience, that comes next. Education, and then the optional ones at the bottom include training, volunteer, memberships. That could also be awards. Um, I said memberships. This is on my website. So if you guys want to go to my website, lindsayhowell.com, there's a box to fill in and you will receive all of this and more. So don't feel like you need to write it all down unless you like taking notes. Um, so the most common hours to include are your total pilot command, turbine PIC, turbine site and command, multi-engine time. Um, 
obviously, if you don't have that, then your next will be, you know, um, instruction, IMC, any of those times in your logbook right now that pertain to where you are, you put those up there, okay? Um, do not round your time to the nearest five or zero thinking it looks nice. You wanna have what's on your resume, be precise. And that should also match your logbook, which should also match your application, okay? So you don't wanna have three sets of different times when you're presenting your documents to someone, right? Yeah. So you would suggest I guess updating it every single time you before you walk into uh, any, I guess, interview or what about application wise or yeah, you know it's a really good rule of thumb. Yeah. Every day. I get in the habit of, of if you're applying for the airlines, get in the habit of updating every month or every six months. Um, and then, yeah, when you are interviewing, have it as up to date as you can. You might have just, you know, um, landed after a, a five day trip and you don't have, you know, those last 13 hours or whatever log, but that's okay. It's still pretty accurate. Um, just don't round your times, use accurate, right? Attention to detail. It's not necessary to list no limitations because that is HIPAA protected. So all you need to do is just list. FAA first class medical. You don't have to say no limitations, okay? That's HIPAA. Um, and then include your employment in both month and year for all of those. It's very obvious. Um, when I'll back up a bit. When you we're talking about your documentation, when you have lived at a residence from you know May 1st to December 15th, and then you moved on the 30th to the 15th. Use those accurate dates as well, because it's really obvious when someone is always moving on the first or they're starting a new job on the 30th or the 15th, right? So be accurate. You want your resume and your application to match. You never want someone who is offering you a job to have to flip through your paperwork trying to figure out were they really here at this time. Oh, it shows that they were over here doing this. And you don't want them to be confused with your paperwork. Um, we just said that, verify all your dates and be consistent on your application. Well, only your position, not the company, because then it really stands out your position. And same with your degree, just bold your degree. You don't wanna have so much going on that when they look at your resume, there's italicized and bold and bullet points and um, you wanna have it be very clean, right? Yeah. So when we apply for a very first flying job, obviously the previous experiences are not in aviation or not as pilots. Do we put those on there and how far back do we go? Um, it's either going to be the past 10 years or until you graduated college. Um, so yeah, I mean, if, if your jobs are obviously, you know, retail, put, up, put those jobs, put that experience down. Yes. What do you do if there's a gap in your employment history? Um, you can make a note on your application, usually because you'll be putting all of that on your application as well, and you can make a note on your application about that. Um, and it will probably come up in your interview, and at that time you can explain. I was traveling Europe for a year during this time. I was raising babies for two years during this time. I was working on my degree, right? Sometimes there's a gap of employment because you, you stopped working for a year to finish your degree, right? So it's usually as long as you can explain it, it's okay. They wanna be able to match you, not that you were just disappeared off in Africa for a year and they don't really know what you were doing. That's when we get a little sketchy. <laughs> um, okay. And then include all your positions at each company, including the dates and aircraft. This comes up when you have a captain and first officer role at a company. Sometimes the you know, pilots will just say, I was captain, um, but you're also a first officer. So let them know, obviously, that you were a first officer for a year and you upgraded at that time. So that's how you could put both those positions, okay? Any questions, usually resumes, 
are a big topic of discussion. One page. Yeah. Yep. One page. There is there is really no reason you should have more than one page. So if our resume has like different positions outside of being a pilot, normally on the regular resume you're like, was in charge of this, implemented this, yada yada. I'm assuming we don't want to get into that de details on like an airline resume, right? Yeah. So, right, because most people know the job of a first officer, right? And so you don't really need to have a lot of description unless it's an unusual job where you were, you know, flying for a contract gig in Afghanistan, perhaps. Well, let us know what you're doing, right? That's okay. Um, without a lot of aviation background, you could certainly just put your job descriptions up there, right? Manager, customer service, you know, those good buzzwords questions with resume. So like I said, if you guys go to my website, lindsayhowell.com, I'll give it to you at the end. There's a whole bunch of uh, resume tips you could get off there too. Okay, so documentation. Okay, so that kind of sums up the documentation you need to know for getting a job. This is a bonus slide. So it's something that is obviously um, a buzzword these days, networking, right? So Another thing I'm totally passionate about. So networking 101. What are your networks? Give me an example of one of your networks. Um, I currently have an instructor who also has a student whose husband is married, who lives in SkyWest, like senior management, and then to the Southwest. So we had dinner the other night and got his business card. And, you know, Excellent. Good thing. Yeah. From the inside, I guess. So these are my networks. So my college, past jobs, organizations, and another past job. I volunteer in some other groups. One of my biggest mentors was a guy I taught to fly from a local flying club. Or maybe you have a church or spiritual group you attend. Those are also networks. So we have a lot of networks around us that maybe we wouldn't necessarily consider networks, right? Soon the people in this room will be your networks. Okay, you will call on these people one day. Oh, they have a job here. Oh, that sounds good. Tell me more. Oh, here's my resume. Okay. Um, so if you're wondering who your networks are, it's really smart to draw those bubbles, right? Those clubs, organizations, jobs, schools, friends, and then who do you know there? And then start talking to them. Say, yeah, I really want to fly a Gulfstream someday. Oh, really? I had no idea. My cousin flies a Gulfstream. Here's his contact, right? If you're not talking about your dreams or what you want to do, no one's going to know and no one's going to be there to be of assistance. People love helping, okay? Um, so I was flying a Citation 10 for a lady. She sold it. I told my best friend from K-State that I want to fly seaplanes in the Caribbean. She says, oh, I know a guy who's down there flying seaplanes. She put me in touch with him. He walked in my resume and I got a job at Seaborne Airlines. The job I am flying now, um, I used to fly with a guy 12 years ago in Monterey, California. And he called me up randomly this spring and asked if I wanted to fly with him again. Um, an old contact. Um, there's a lot of people who you will move about with in aviation. So obviously don't burn bridges, right? You never know who you're gonna run into. Aviation is so small and it is so important to maintain those, those networks. Networking is not always just, you know, asking for a job. It's maintaining those relationships. So have a good attitude, show up to the airport, on your days off. Be the person who's willing to work an extra day. Smile, be someone that someone wants to work with because someday someone might think, oh gosh, that person was really fun and I need a pilot. I wonder where they're at now. Let me give them a call because they remember you. They remember your work ethic. That Citation 10 job that I got was because a pilot needed a replacement pilot and all of his friends were busy. So he asked the line guys at a local FBL. And the line guy said, call Lindsay, she'll help. What's her last name? I don't know. 
So they asked the CSRs and the FBO and gave them my contact information. I get a random phone call one day. Is this Lindsay? Yeah, this is Mark Marshall. I need a pilot. Are you available? Yes, I am, right? I've always said yes. So <laughs> be available. So something else I want to talk about is online networking as well, because obviously it's it's a thing, right? You meet people on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, that you may not necessarily know, but it's kind of starting to be a kind of a normal thing to start networking online. Um, I have an example of one day I had two different people contact me. One says, um, oh, you fly out of Rocky Mountain Metro Airport. I live in Denver. I said, oh, that's great. Who do you fly for? I told him, are you guys looking for a pilot? No, we're not. Never heard from him again. Same day, another female pilot contacted me. Oh, hey, I saw the picture of you road biking. I love road biking. That's so that's so great. We, we connected. I'm still friends with this person online. We talk, we share information. And someday, this is the person I might be talking to about a future job, right? I don't know where this guy went, but she's still here. So it's really important. When you go about online networking, have a good attitude, okay? <laughs> Any questions with that? So I know it's kind of like this abstract idea right now where you're like, I don't really know much about networking. I'm just trying to build my hours. I don't know what to do. Um, be aware of, of those possible networks and those people you meet someday. Uh, go out to the Scottsdale airport every Sunday for breakfast and see who you, who you interact with, okay? Um, okay, so what's your dream machine? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. You know, I have to be honest, the Mesa. I'll say that. Excellent. It is a beautiful airplane. How about you? Well, for now, it'd be a hopper. Okay. Also, something wide body at the best line Airbus. Perfect. Yeah. So. How about you? Honestly, I don't know. Like my goal is airlines, but mainly because I don't know what else is out there, to be honest. Sure. Like I would love to learn everything like all over other. Like I talk to other people and I'm like, oh my God, I didn't know you could do that. So I am wide open right now. Awesome. You. I'm a triple seven model. All right. A girl who knows what she wants. <laughs> Um, 787 is a pretty awesome airplane right now, but uh, I hope in the future we get back to supersonic and maybe near the end of my career, get oh, to fly that. Dreaming big, I like it. Thank you. Excellent. So, the guy who walked in my resume at Seaburn Airlines turned out to also steal my heart, and I married him, and he is a 787 instructor now for United. Nice. Okay. And here we were just two kids flying seaplanes in the Caribbean in our, in our boat shoes, right? So you never know where, where aviation is gonna take you. Um, okay, so how's everyone feeling? Should we keep going or do you guys wanna double back to interviewing or what do you feel like? Setting goals, interviewing, are we getting goals? Setting goals? Okay. okay, what? Go back. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is really fun because about half of you guys were really clear on what it is that you wanted to do, what you want to do, right? You see that plane. And I think it's really important when we talk about setting goals to have that end result, right? Or for you, maybe it's just getting your private pilot license. Maybe it's just your commercial, right? And that is your next goal. So or we could be bigger we could dream supersonic this is my goal and i'm going to work backwards this is these are the steps i'm going to take to get there so for goal setting this is the, so we kind of just bounce around in aviation right like oh i want to fly this i want to fly this i want to do this and that is great um but it's also really important that if you if you do have that specific goal write it down because a lot of times what do they say the difference between a goal and a dream is a date on the calendar Okay, so write it down. And then 
start getting into that that good energy, right? I am so grateful and happy today that I am flying blank with blank for blank. So if you want to fly for a private family, write that down. If you want to fly for Delta Airlines, write that down. If you want to fly for Customs and Border Patrol, write that down, okay? For me, I wanted to fly uh, seaplanes in a warm place with happy people. That was my dream. I wrote that down and then I took those action steps to get there. Um, and then get into that feeling. So when you first wake up in the morning, have that thought, have that vision. Um, and then what does that feel like to you? Does it feel prideful? Does it feel exciting? Does it feel fun? Um, and then start working backwards. What are those steps you need to take? Set those 30, 90, and six month goals. Um, what is that next step you need to take? What can I do this week to do it? If you are working on your commercial, does that mean you need to fly three times a week? Do you need to schedule yourself six times because you keep getting canceled for weather? Um, what about studying for your written? Do you want to schedule an hour every morning to study for your written test? Start writing those things down of how to achieve that goal because we all know in aviation it gets really expensive if you're only flying once a week and then that next week you have to redo that lesson and you're just going, I know you guys are more on um, a path, but it's also really good to have those personal goals of this is what I want to do each day, each week, each month, okay? Um, I, one of my favorite pilots is a firefighter, a wildland firefighter. She flies the CL-415, so those big super scoopers that come land in the water and they scoop up all the water and they fly and they dump it out on the forest fire, right? So she knew that's what she wanted to do. She went to the company and she says, how do I do this? Um, she had flown on glaciers and she had her single engine seaplane and they say they said, come back with more PIC, multi-engine seaplane time. And so she went to the, the Maldives and she was a captain there and she flew for two years before coming back to this company and said, <laughs> I'm back, I'm back and here's my experience. And she got hired, right? So this woman set out with this goal, this is what I wanna do and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get there. Get into action, right? We're not just sitting at home, you know, having all those good feelings, we get into action. So these are the steps to help you do that. So we're pretty much turning on your brain. This is called the STTTR method. I didn't make this up, but someone I follow, um, this is his program. So S is for strategies. What are two to three ideas of how you'll achieve um, your goals? So once you start turning that on in your brain, um, you start reducing the anxiety and the stress. Tactics, what are those specific action steps? Um, it engages several parts of the brain and your motor co um, complex, cortex. Um, and then you start identifying as a goal achiever, right? Your brain, your body's like, I am setting these goals, here I'm going. So timeline, sorry, that's for timeline. When you say on Monday, I'm gonna do X, the brain sees a timeline and starts organizing the steps to get there. And then you start identifying as a goal achiever. Tools, what tools can you use? Um, what tools do you guys have around here to use? Simulator, instructors, resources, me, other webinars, right? Um, and then resources, what can you come up with to help you get there? Um, a mentor, an advisor, um, maybe a friend has a family member who is a corporate pilot. So um, those are some resources. So can you guys think of any other tools or resources that you have available to you? Internet, right? There's so many great flying videos out there. Um, I didn't have the internet. Well, I kind of did have the internet when I was learning to fly, but we didn't have, you know, the YouTube video of how do I, you know, look this up. Um, so this goes back to, okay, let's do, who has a goal that they're working on right now? Yeah, what's your goal? Mine's written, PPL. You're written, okay. So how are you doing that? Do you have a date? Yes, more or less. <laughs> I'm just making sure I study for it every day and um, utilizing my resources. Okay. My other instructors. 
instructors, my instructor, doctor friends, you know, other pilots just to with some things that I'm just not getting, you know, I reach out and I'm like, okay, explain this to me in human, not pilot. Right. Yeah, it's <laughs> right. So do you have a goal in mind of when you want to take your written? By the end of the month. Okay. So do you have set days where you're studying? Every day. Every day. So do you set off an hour of your calendar every day? I don't set the time. I just sit down and start studying. <laughs> okay. How do you study? Um, read the documents, go over some books that I have, um, watch some videos, kind of pluck a little bit from everywhere I can. So here's a really good technique. It's called the Pomodoro uh, technique, and it's Italian for those old uh, kitchen clocks that look like tomatoes. So set that for 25 minutes and study for 25 minutes. You're turning on the focus part of your brain and then take a five minute break. Don't do anything aviation related. Do jumping jacks, eat a donut, watch something funny on TV and then set it again for 25 minutes. So what happens is when you're using that focus part of your brain, it is chunking in the information you're studying because it is focused. Then when you go do your five minutes of playtime, that's called the fuse mode. And it's letting your brain place that information. It's like a backhoe taking it and being like, okay, we're gonna dump this in. So it's like, you know, if you guys, you're working on a problem, you can't find the solution, you're working, you're working, you're working, oh, I give up, I don't get this anymore, you go for a walk and all of a sudden it happens because now the diffuse part of your brain is working and you have found the solution without even looking for it. So it's a good, it's a good way to start studying. Set 25 minute timer, study intently. If you're on a roll, keep going, but then take that break, go for a walk, do jumping jacks, whatever. Okay. And if you, I study best in the morning. So if you study best in the morning or nighttime, utilize that. They also say, we think like, oh, I'm only a visual learner. Oh, I only learn best by hearing things. Apparently that's not true. We need all of those senses to help us learn. So by reading, listening, and applying is actually how you become a better learner. Um, and then by testing yourself, over, like doing those practice tests, um, you're, tr you're chunking in the information in your brain, even though you're thinking, gosh, I'm not really learning anything here. I'm just doing this practice test and um, don't worry, it is actually getting into your brain, <laughs> okay? Um, any other questions with goal setting? So, Strategies, come up with a couple strategies to get into action, what can you do? Tactics, have those specific action steps. How I'm gonna study, where I'm gonna study, different ways to study. Um, timeline, set that goal. I wanna have my written done by November 1st. And three days a week, I'm gonna spend an hour studying for it in the library. And then two days a week, I'm gonna have my friend quiz me. Um, tools, the tools I'm going to use, Lime, Jeppesen, my friends, my instructor, uh, resources, the school, everything else, okay? All right, that's all for goals. Any questions with that? Pretty straightforward. Obviously, it's really good to have goals in aviation, right? Absolutely, absolutely, because aviation is always changing, right? We know that. It is, it definitely is, but it's a lot of fun, so that's why we're all sticking with it, right? <laughs> Perfect. Um, are we good on time? Does anyone keep going? Okay. This is where it gets fun. It goes back to what is your dream machine and setting those goals, okay? And it's 2020, everything's already a little weird and awkward, so just trust me. <laughs> oh, that's fine. Okay, so there's supposed to be some fun audio here. Let's, no, it's not gonna work. Um, okay, so close your eyes. Okay, now picture yourself you're in your hotel room, you're ironing your uniform, your pilot shirt, 
you're getting it nice and crisp. It looks really good. You put it on the hanger, you pull out your phone, you check your bank balance. It's looking good. You've got some money in there. Your first paycheck cleared the bank. You're pretty happy about this. You put your uniform back on, or you put your uniform on. You put your tie on, you make sure your shoes look good. You put your epaulots, your wing, your badge. You go downstairs, you meet your co-captain for coffee. You're five minutes early because all good pilots are five minutes early. And you guys wait for the van. You go out to the airport, you check in, you go to the crew room, maybe you get another cup of coffee. You're looking good. People are smiling at you. You love walking through the airport. This is exciting. It's fun. There's people going places. You go out to the airplane, you pre flight, you get it ready. It looks good. Clean bird, no maintenance issues. It's morning, the sunrise is beautiful. You take a couple pictures. You can't wait to share them with your friends. You sit in the cockpit and you feel so good sitting in your 787 or your Hawker or your supersonic jet. And you feel like all of your training and hard work has paid off. You look good in your uniform. You have so much pride and excitement. You've finally made it. And everything has paid off. You check ATIS, the weather's good. You check your flight plan, NOTAMS, everything's still looking good. You're ready for your first flight. Where are you going? Are you going to Tokyo? You going to Las Vegas? You going to New York City? Paris? Maybe you're in the islands, Hawaiian islands, Caribbean islands. You're living the dream. You are finally where you've always wanted to be. You start boarding passengers. You're greeting them like you always said you were going to do. You're handing out wings to the kids. Everyone's so excited they're going on vacation with you. Your crew is cool. You've talked to the flight attendants. You've got your beverages in the cockpit. You guys close the door and you call for push, push back. Now, I know aviation is not in a great place, but you guys are in a great spot to be in that aircraft and that uniform in a couple of years and it's gonna be all worth it by the time you guys get there. If you have a very specific image, keep that image, hold on to it. And yeah, it could change and it probably will and it might change a couple of times and that's okay because aviation does that, okay? How do you guys feel? You have that, that good feeling? Is your heart full? Hang on to that feeling, okay? Do you know want to share? So this, I've already spoken about this, but this was my dream, wanting to fly seaplanes in the Caribbean. That's the Twin Otter on floats in the Christiansted Harbor in St. Croix. Yeah. Um, so I had this dream and I did just that. I had that vision that I hung on to and I worked backwards. I went and got my multi-engine seaplane rating. I applied for the job. I interviewed. They weren't quite hiring. I interviewed again and I went down to the Caribbean and I flew seaplanes. Like I said, I've never had a lot of direct dreams in aviation. I've just always wanted to be up there. But every once in a while, this happens and it's going to happen to you too. Okay. 
Questions? So that's pretty much the end of my presentation. We could always go back, but I think we're good. And if you guys have any questions, I'm, I'm open to talk a lot about anything we went over today or anything else that came up. Um, so I also do career coaching. I talked a little bit beforehand about um, what I do, but I developed the five-step plan to the flight deck. I do it in private groups, one-on-one -on -one or small groups. It's six weeks via Zoom. Next one starts October 19th. We do homework, weekly text messages, emails, and if you're interested in that, I'd love to have any of you guys on my next course. Just talk to me afterwards. Um, I also do many job prep services where I will do an hour-long mock interview, and then we spend 30 minutes going over all that paperwork. For 2020, I do a special where I do a 20-minute resume review for $20. It's 2020. Um, and then an hour uh, phone call as well on any topic if you have any questions or issues or problems. I also offer just a 15-minute um, consultation phone call just to see, you know, if you guys want to work with me, if we jive, if you have any questions, you can find my calendar on my website as well, and we could go from there. Um, so there's my website, lindsayhowell.com. My email, howelllindsay at gmail. There's three L's in the middle. It messes everyone up. Um, but also my Instagram, if you guys want to share any key takeaways today on social media, um, you know, I would, I would love to see what you learned and what your favorite thing was or any questions, be sure to tag me. So any other questions? Do we have any webinar questions? Uh, there was one specific to your website, but I already responded. Oh, perfect. So thank you. You're good. Okay. I mean, we can give them a few minutes in case there's okay. anybody else that might have a question. Perfect. Uh, and then, depending on the device that they're using, uh, whether it's a tablet or whatever, there's going to be like a questions box where they can type that in. So if you want to let them know, I don't know if they can hear me. Oh, oh, if you guys have any questions on the webinar, there's a questions box. You could just write in your question um, and we'll get your question answered. You guys have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, forgive me if you covered this uh, I messed up down for a couple minutes, but <clears throat> as far as interviewing uh, appearance, attire, so forth, I have uh, not gone to interview, obviously, because I'm a student, but I have been to events that had cattle call type interviews happening at the same time, and there seems to be a standard, if you will, very, everyone looks exactly. I mean, you think that they bought the shoes and socks and suits and ties for the same school night. Exactly the same. I like to, because I'm a little bit older than the normal, set myself just a little bit apart from the rest to be noticed. Uh, how much deviation would you consider acceptable from the coffee cat look as far as interview? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the advice is. Or I guess the question is, I want to look comfortable when I'm interviewing, but I don't want to look like all the other pilots. How can I go either side of that? And, you know, you don't want to show up in your Dumb and Dumber, baby blue or orange suit. Right. Okay. Right. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. If you have, um, you know, something that is still very professional, but you're very comfortable wearing, that's fine. If you have a lucky lime green tie, that's fine. Um, do you have a, like a purple suit that you love, or are you asking, you no, know, colors or? Just asking in general. It seems like okay, you got the, you know, you got the black yeah. cap to Oxford to the black suit, and then maybe. There's a reason black, for that. It's just, it's like, <laughs> wow, these are all exactly the same. Yeah. And then what's what? Ooh. Yeah. There's a, a charcoal gray suit. Sure. Ooh, I like that guy. Yeah. Charcoal gray suit. Yeah. You know, he's just. He looks wonderful, but he's just a little bit different. Now, yep. is that bad or good? And so all pilots kind of look the same because it's the common advice, wear navy blue, black, or dark charcoal, right? Um, you guys are wearing uniforms, and, and that goes back to professionalism. You want the person flying your aircraft to look like a professional. You want to be able to trust them. And how else can you trust them without knowing how they look? You don't know if they're a good pilot or not, but they look good and you trust them. 
right? So it's that professional appearance. And sometimes everyone does kind of look the same, but it's it goes back to being a professional, right? How does your lawyer look? How does your accountant look, right? You, you trust these people. And so they wear suits, right? So it's kind of hard, but it's still um, play the game, <laughs> right? Yeah. To piggyback on that question, for females, as pilots, we wear pants for obvious reasons. But if you show up in an interview, how important is it to wear a pantsuit or a skirt suit? Either one is fine. The biggest thing is is to to be comfortable when you're interviewing. So, oh, it went away. So, on um, on interviewing, I talk about your um, presentation, your preparation and your professionalism, okay? So your presentation is, is how you look. And if you're wearing something that you're not comfortable with and you're kind of like, oh God, this thing doesn't fit and you're like, oh, that's what people are gonna notice. So you can wear pants or you can wear a skirt suit, but if you're comfortable and you have that confidence, that's what we wanna do. Same thing with, with a tie or shoes or jewelry, right? We want minimal jewelry. We want you know nice, neat hair, pulled back, clean shaven. Um, you don't really want to be like like fidget, like oh I got this blister on my foot I'm fidgeting right so it all goes back to that that presentation of of who you are and that is your appearance and your paperwork that makes sense so interviewing so <laughs> uh, because it's brought up we'll we'll just hit on that real quick so a lot of times interviews um, will ask tell me about a time question it's the T M A T T so tell me about a time when, and they're asking for a specific question. And the response is called STAR, S-T-A-R, so the STAR format. So that's um, situation, task, action, result. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I'm interviewing and I have to think of like, tell me about a time when, S-T, did I give them the A, did I give them the R? That gets really hard for me to keep it in track. So what I talk about is set the stage and then tell your story. All good stories have a beginning, middle, and an end. So when you're interviewing, you want to set the stage. It was a, a night flight out of Denver in a snowstorm. I was the pilot flying. I was pilot not flying. I was second in command. I was PIC. Let them know your position. What are you flying? Um, I'm flying a, a King Air in a snowstorm at night. So we're, we're setting the stage here, right? It's already kind of like, ooh, this is intense. What's going to happen? We depart Denver, my captain maybe did something that I thought was against regulations. I queried him on it. Um, this could be, tell me about a time you had a conflict in the cockpit, right? So tell us the conflict, what happened? We landed, we got out the SOPs, we debriefed the situation and we agreed that um, yes, we, could have done it this way and next time we will also ask the jump seater and back or we'll contact the flight attendants we'll call uh, dispatch um, we debrief and then we we went on our way so that's a lot easier than thinking star did i do all of this okay also with the tell me about a time when story they want a specific situation tell me about it a time so you're not answering well sometimes i fly with this pilot and she's just you know, give them a specific time of what happened. When you're interviewing, it's really important to think, God, why are they asking me about leadership? Well, maybe they want to see what your leadership style is. How do you, how do you, what kind of pilot are you, right? Are you just going to sit there and be like, well, that, I don't think that's safe, but I'm not going to say anything. Okay. So show them, think about what the question is so that when you answer it, they have no doubt that not only are you safe, competent professional pilot, okay? So, and it's okay to talk pilot talk, um, but your job is also to inform them, not to entertain them. So don't be like, it was a dark and stormy night. And, oh my God, you wouldn't believe what was going on and this, and then, you know? So, <laughs> right? You don't wanna entertain. You're not like on a stage doing an impromptu comedy show. You're letting them know that you are a safe, competent pilot. And you do that by your, by your interview answers. Okay, so some of the biggest mistakes um, interviewing is not answering the question. So in most interviews, you'll be able to write down the question. This is really good because it gives you a moment to pause, take a breath, write it down. If it's a two-part question and you realize that halfway through you didn't answer the second part, make sure you go back and answer that second part. So 
number one, not answering the question, okay? Um, not presenting yourself, not speaking clearly. A lot of this, oh, and then we did this and I was like, oh my gosh, right? So present yourself, speak clearly, um, have all your documentation ready and accurate. A lot of times people have, you know, their logbooks were stolen out of their car and they show up to an interview and they're like, I don't know, they got stolen. What do you want me to do? <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to go back and try to like, Get those records as best as you can. Get them printed out from your flight school. Go back to your flight instructors. Get those times back as accurate as you can, and then show up with a police report. Let them know that you at least put the, the footwork in to make that situation right, okay? Um, anything else with interviewing? Uh, there was a question online uh, going back to resumes. It's kind of a long yeah. survey. How far back should you date volunteering uh, is the 10 year rule pretty standard for everything? Question mark. Yeah, so the question is how far back should I um, date volunteer experience? So if you know, you really only need to do, you know, maybe three to four volunteer positions on your resume. You don't want to have 10 years of volunteer at the bottom of your resume in like one job, right? So if you don't have any recent experience, except for like 10 years ago, get some, go volunteer. You have a question? Okay. Uh, there's another, uh, okay. So uh, someone had said the meditation visualization was a great help. Thank you very much for this wonderful experience. Awesome. And then there was another one uh, asking, Tell us what you or what you love about your work with seaplanes. Oh, <laughs> well, um, question about seaplanes. So I think the the most amazing thing about seaplanes in general, whether it's single engine or multi engine seaplanes, is there is nothing else. Maybe flying gliders, but you are free to to pretty much take off and land wherever there's water, and that's pretty cool. So you know you could be flying over a lake and decide oh i want to land over there and you could do that and that's pretty amazing and the next thing you know you're doing a splash and go or then you become a boat and that's pretty cool too so um someone recommended to me very early on go get my single engine seaplane rating it's the best flying you'll ever do and i took that advice and i even gave that advice today to a friend um, sometimes it's really valuable just to kind of have fun in aviation i know training and getting those hours and building that time and thinking you know i've got to be in the hustle and bustle but don't forget aviation is a lot of fun too, whether that's gliders or tailwheels, seaplanes. Um, it gives you that experience that might also set you apart from someone else in an interview someday. Long answer. Um, there was another question. If you have uh, an accident or incident, would it affect your hiring process? You said be honest, but how uh, would you make it work for you? Sure. So. Um, how would you go about having an accident or incident um, if you are in an interview? So once again, um, same thing for if you failed a check ride, right? You want to take responsibility for what happened. Um, I'll talk about check ride and then I'll get to the accident because I think there's overlap there and it's probably more common to have failed a check ride than had an accident. Um, having a failed check ride, if you're in an interview, most likely, have you ever failed a check ride? Yes, I have. Tell me about that. Oh, this examiner just was out to get me and they're getting their numbers and the weather was bad and the plane, the GPS was broken, so they moved me to a plane I didn't know about. And I just, you know, my instructor didn't sign me off for this and everything. That's a lot of pushing the blame on someone else, right? You guys get that. So when you're asked, tell me about a time you failed a check ride, you can say, yes, I did. I failed my private pilot check ride. I was out of PTS standards for turns around a point. And I retrained with my instructor the next week. And five days after that, I retrained and passed my check ride. There's a big difference with that. It's taking responsibility and you're talking about it matter of factly, like a professional, right? Everyone fails check rides. It's okay to fail a check ride. It goes back to not wanting that negative pattern, failed check ride, speeding ticket, felony, DUI, failed check ride, right? You don't want to do that. So same thing with um, an accident. 
um, you have to be matter of factly about it. I know a couple people who I worked with on interviews who actually ended up getting a job at United because they had the NTSB report with them when they interviewed, they had the documentation, um, they had their, you know, the retrained flights in their logbook. Everything was out there in the open. There was no like, I'm not wanting to talk about this. I'm going to hide this. I hope it doesn't come up. They said, yes, I did. Here's everything you'll need to know about that. I would love to talk about any questions you have. And that's okay. So that's how I would go about having had an accident or incident. Yeah. I'll follow on to that. Um, I have spoken with uh, recruiters in the past just from my own curiosity, uh, even before I started getting training. And they sort of the general consensus was okay. You're a PPL student. A lot of people do it for fun or a hobby or whatever before they actually decide they want to get into serious aviation, mainline, commercial, whatnot. And the consensus was, okay, you can have some issues during your PPL, but once you get your private license, you better be spot on from there on out. Get your ratings as fast as possible, as professionally as possible as few deviations as possible. Would you say that that's a correct assessment or would you add or take away from that? I would say having that goal in mind is excellent, but we all know that's not always going to happen. And if it doesn't, don't beat yourself up. Don't quit flying. Don't change careers. Just know that, yeah, that is the goal is I want to do this. I want to make sure everything's perfect, but the reality is it's probably not going to be that way. So if there's a hiccup or something happens, just keep flying. Stay proficient and current. Uh, if you did want any more slides, all you can do is We're good. back there. So, okay. Uh, there was one more question. Early on, uh, you did a pick your adventure and talked about one of the three topics. Can you touch on the other two? Yeah. So I I ended up actually going all over or going all going over all three topics. Um, goal setting, interviewing, and documentation. So we did kind of circle back and hit on, on interviewing. So, hope you're happy. So, as someone who's paying a good amount of money to go through training right now, I'm kind of like looking at different organizations that might be like great to join, but a lot of times they can be like quite expensive. Um, and so, when you're looking at putting it on a resume, like how long in advance would you say uh, makes it look a lot more beneficial to be in that uh, organization, being that like you're kind of like strapped when you're first going through and you don't have, like we don't have jobs right now or anything like that. So like, obviously you want it as long as possible, but if like six months look, look good, is it like a year before they're really like, all right, this guy is really on board with this organization, like what would you recommend? You know, you don't, you don't feel like you need to have memberships just to get a job. If it's something that you really want to do, that's great. But if if you're doing it just for your resume, it, it's not going to benefit you. If if it's something like Angel Flight that you enjoy, yes. If it's women in aviation and you enjoy going to the conferences, do it. Um, if it's OBAP, absolutely, because you like it. Don't ever think that you just have to pay it just to get it on your resume to look good. Spend your time volunteering or doing something that you enjoy. But to answer your question, a year, do it for a year. But then be involved, right? Sure. Because once again, that's networking and you have no idea what's gonna happen. I also got a job flying in Monterey because of a woman I met at a women aviation conference. The next year I attended, she offered me a job because she met me the year prior, okay? So you have no idea, right? There was another question that just popped up. Uh, it's like a hypothetical question. You found lots of errors on your logbook uh, and you decided to correct it. Would you white out or uh, write it on a new page? What is the best action to correct multiple errors? Yeah, so um, I, when I was a new pilot, I loved green out. I'm like, this is the greatest thing. It matches the logbook page. It's perfect. Um, but I think that the correct answer is draw a simple line through your times and on the next page or at the end, audit and correct for the times. And you could say times corrected for 
you know, whatever it is, and then just initial that. Make it as neat as possible. Once again, white out, green out, gluing your pages together, it all looks like you're hiding something. Don't do that. <laughs> if you did, it's okay too, right? Just just keep looking better. <laughs> the more flying you you get, okay. <laughs> The rest is a lot of thank you. Thank you. There's no like this. So Perfect. Okay. No other questions. So. Well, like I said, um, I'll stick around and talk with you guys and answer any other questions. You can find me online. I I really like sharing this information. This is stuff that I wish I had as you know a young student 20 years ago. Um, and I just think it's really smart to put all of this stuff together now before you know, you go any further so you can start knowing what's what's needed of you and what's important at this stage. So like I said, I, I really love helping and sharing. So, you know, thank you guys for your time. I know your time is really important. You guys could be out there building hours and so you're here with me. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you.